you want to start this year? I'm ready. You can start. You want to talk with Dr. Zhao is going to talk about closure devices, and then we will field any questions about AFib afterwards. Dr. McKinney should be here, so both of them will be around to answer any questions. In the back, there's a questionnaire. If we would fill it out, we would appreciate it. Um, it will tell us if there's any future things you want to hear about, or kind of tell us how we're doing. This will be archived on our website in a, a three weeks. You want to go, Dr. First, thanks everybody come here for the meeting tonight. And uh, we talk about left atrial appendage. This is a very, very new topic area in the last two to three years. It's very hot topic in the EP field to manage of the atrial fibrillation. Majority of the procedure or device we're talking today is actually investigated. It's not FDA approved. So sometimes some centers try to use it over the label and uh, we use something, you will see the slide today, and only FDA approved device called Watchman. So I probably more focus on Watchman today, but we don't start it yet because all the reimbursement, in indication, patient selection, sometimes it's more complex than it's in the articles. <clears throat> so we all know the atrial fibrillation is the most important reason for stroke. When we're getting older, every 10 years, the risk for stroke with, due to the atrial fibrillation probably doubles or triples. So you can see this slide, the percentage of stroke which caused by the AFib is really depend on your age. The patient more older, the chance when they have AFib, they have almost reached 30% chance to have a stroke is related to the AFib. When you're young, your risk is less than 10%. So the age is contribute a lot of risk factor during the AFib cause the stroke. So usually in the clinic field, how we know which patient, how many risk they are. Whether you are a high risk patient, so you have to take the blood thinner, or you are a relative low risk, you probably don't need to take anything. So usually, we use the chest score at all time. But recently, there is a chest vascular score involved coronary disease, vascular disease, and increased age. So usually, the more high score you are, and the more risk you will have a stroke. But if your chest score or chest vest score is zero, it doesn't mean you don't have stroke. So when you see this, if even you have the score is zero, you still have a population less than 2% of risk of stroke if you're in the atrial fibrillation. So the question is, where the thrombosis come from, and why I get the chance for the stroke. So, from the history we know, most of the thrombosis with the patient who do not have a valve problem, they don't have rheumatoid, uh, rheumatic valve disease, reason is because the penicillin antibiotic we use, this kind of rheumatic valve disease is very rare in this country. So most of people is not rheumatic valve disease, and all these people, their cloud, depend on what technology you use and confirm with that, most of the people from the appendage. So then you will ask, where is the appendage, and what the anatomy is located to cause the problem? So you will see, this is the heart, it's a, you cut from the head to toes. So usually our heart is a four chambers organs. You have two chambers, uh, right and left, and you have the bottom chamber. The bottom chamber we call the ventricle, it's a major pump engines. So when we talk about heart failure, we all 
we talk about the bottom chamber function. But when we talk about atrial fibrillation, we talk about electricity. Oh, sorry. Problem with the upper chamber. I usually tell my patient, think about your car <coughs> like a house, a second floor house. So you have walls, and during the walls you have plumbing, and you have the electricity system. So the atrial fibrillation is the second floor electricity go wrong. And when they go wrong, your light in the second floor is flashing very quickly. Usually when you have atrial fibrillation, normally people, the upper chamber beat about 60 to 100 beats per minute. But when you have atrial fibrillation, sometimes you can beat at 400 to 600 beats per minute. So it's shaking. The, the blood flow is not sequentially from upper chamber pump to the lower chamber and is turbulent inside the atrium. So the appendage is a residue part of the atrium. You have appendage in the right side, and you have appendage in the left side. So when the blood flow very slow and turbulent in this area, the cells in the blood try to build a cloud. And when they build a cloud, and they dislodge from the ventricle and the pump from the aorta. So when you go to the head, you will get a stroke. If you go to the limbs, other body, you will get ischemia attack, like a leg pains, painful, cold, or the other stuff. So this is when we do the T, we put the big probe through the mouth to the esophagus. And then we take a picture in the back of the heart, it's close to the heart. So when you see that, that there is a big cloud here, is that usually when the people is normal, this is just an empty space. And when they build a cloud, you will see a big cloud here. So when they did dislodge, there will be a troublemaker. So this is where the stroke cloud come from. <coughs> so then we have cloud, we find it, then we say, okay, then we have to take some medications. So the old time, the Kumadi is very common, it's cheaper, but the Kumadi has other issues. You have to draw the blood frequently, sometimes some food, vegetation you cannot take, sometimes you're too low, not protect you, sometimes it's too high, it causes the bleeding. So all the random clinic trial of the comedy in atrial fibrillation show the benefit. You probably get 60-70% protection from the stroke, but not always. And the, when we, oh, sorry. When we see this slide, it means depend on your ages and what kind of group of ages Less than 65, 65 to 74, 74 to 84, or above 84. The more older the patient is, the more benefit when you take comedy. But the problem with these issues is when we're getting older, we, we have lung issues, we have kidney issues, liver issues. So the doctors is actually hesitant to give the patient who can get most the benefit on the comedy. So Kumini is a good idea, but unless you can take it and don't have trouble. <coughs> so this is all the list when you take Kumini, you can face the troubles. You have to have the surgery, you have to stop it, you can GI bleeding, you can urination with blood, and you can have cough the blood, nose bleeding, blah, blah, blah. So it's a lot of trouble when you take the Kumini. And some part of we have some patients come in the hospital, they have a bleeding stroke related to the comedy, even they're in the therapeutic level. So that is the worries. Whenever you take anticoagulation, you always face the risk of bleeding, average probably 2% per year. Depend on your other risk factors, comorbidities, the 
bleeding risk can be even higher. So this is the slide that shows how much average population we percentage use the comb. <coughs> Majority of people is between 65 <coughs> to 75 group patient. And most of the benefit group above 80s and actually is less than 25% to use the comedy and anticoagulations. Other drugs, we now we have three different or four different drugs in the market that we can use instead of comedy. But they have expensive, they also have issues with bleeding too. So then we're talking about now we know 90% of people without valve, rheumatoid valve disease patient thrombosis is from appendage. Then how about we close the appendage? If we close the appendage, then the thrombosis cannot build inside the appendage, whether we decrease our risk for stroke. So this is the, where the closure device comes from. I list a couple of um, device they use in the marketing. The first one is Watchman and it's FDA approved for LA, uh, left appendicular device. This is the only device approved by the FDA now. Dumbukini, is it? Dumbukini, is it FDA only approved for three years and then they have to re-evaluation for this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that means they already passed one year. Yeah, so there's a re-evaluation process. So probably in 2018. Right, they have to reevaluate whether the risk or not. The other, the second system we use is we call the lariat. It's a loop. We will show you the picture later. It's a loop device. You put it from the epicardic entrance and to tight the appendage. They also have some issues, but it's not FDA approved. You use it for over labels. Um, Medtronic has a device called the. Cardio blade closure device. I, I personally don't have see that. Did you see that, Dr. McKinney? I've never seen that. Yeah, I just know they have uh, something like that in the <coughs> testing, the clinic trial now, and not in the marketing. In the old time, there is a um, plaza cardio plug. This is the device FDA approved for closure the holes between the upper chamber. We call this like PFO, or do you have ASD? But some doctors use over the label, use put them in the appendage to close the appendage. But it's never approved by the F, uh, FDA. The other thing is called a plateau. It's like we will show you later in the picture. It's a, like a, a, a balloon device. They suck in the appendage, but it's withdraw from the market because the financial issues from the company and the complications during the clinic. Uh, trials, so they no nobody will use it. The last one we're talking about is what we currently use in this hospital. We call the Actri Clip. Uh, this is FDA used for open the heart surgery direct to close the heart tissue. It's not Pacific approved for appendage close closure for atrial fibrillation. FDA never approved for that. But we have some people with bleeding on coumadin and cannot take bleed, uh, anticoagulation because frequent GI bleeding, transfusions, so we, but they are all high risk patients. We send to Dr. Michael Brothers to get these things. So I will shoot a couple of pictures for you. So this is the Watchman device. Uh, I don't know what the shape would you call, Dr. McKinney, what do you call this kind of shape in English? Umbrella. Umbrella or fish? Okay, whatever. Jellyfish, whatever you call that. Okay. Uh, this is the device FDA approved for appendage closure for atrial fibrillation. They have different size. The smaller one, 21, the large one, 33. The problem with these things, they have five different choices. The problem with these issues is Everybody appendage is different. There is no universal shape of our appendage. Some people have a very broad base appendage. Some people have a very neck and then big appendage later part. And some people have a long appendage. Some people have very short appendage. 
So individually, when you think about doing the watchman device, ideally you want to know the shape of the indi individual patient anatomy of the appendage and try to see whether you can choose the fixed size of the device. So is you have a catheter in, in the later I will show you some pictures to see how they do that. And you deploy it, when you put the catheter in, cross the wall from the right side, cross the wall, we call it the transeptal puncture, and put deploy in the left atrium, and you deploy this umbrella, and it was suck, they have a hook in each area, and then they hook to appendage tissues, and slowly, slowly, the, they will fiber will be covered in it and it will occlusion the device. So this is usually what they do. You put the <coughs> catheter in the right side green area from the vein system and you reach the right side of the heart. And then you puncture a hole across the wall and you put the inside the left side and then you go to the appendage area and deploy the device. So this is what the idea, very beautiful closure, but sometimes it's very difficult to reach these results. And this is the real case. You, you see the normal people without cloud, so it should be a very empty space. So you measure the distance of the base of the appendage and you select it which size of the device. And then you do the transeptal, <laughs> and you can guide it with TEE and tell you how to go to the local appendage area and when you go to the appendage area you do the angiogram so you give the shape of the appendage this is this particular patient and you can measure the distance compared with this things to see whether it's matched to each other <coughs> and after you deploy the device, you see this is the device is deployed. It's perfect match the osteum of the appendage. And you will see the x-ray is in there. And there is no color flow after you close the device. So then this is a perfect thing. But the problem with this situation, sometimes the device is not match each other. You still have some leaking. This year, the heart rhythm society meetings talk a lot of, about the risk with the watchman. So from whatever I heard some people is they're not closure very tightly. The blood still can go in and go out and clouds still can build in. So they also has an issue with this. Some people after the procedure developed heart perforation and the pericarditis, chest pain, fibrosis, a lot of issues with this. So this is the dog models. And after you close your 30 days, the fibrosis will be built around this region. And 45 days, you see it's smoothly closed. This is the ideally you want this happen during everybody. So usually you will see who will be candidate for this device. This is, I just uh, give a slide from a clinic trial practice, it's called practice trial, right? Practice trial for watchmen. Yeah. And uh, they select the major, they say collectively is they have risk for stroke and the patient need anticoagulation. Or some people has high risk <coughs> for stroke and but doctor said you, your risk for bleeding is too high, you cannot take it for that. <laughs> and for you will see this. This criteria is very restrict. It's not every patient we face in the true real world. It's an idea patient. Everybody wants this kind of patient. But the exclude carrier is if you have thrombosis, you cannot do it. If you have a big hole in the second floor and connect left side to the right side, they don't want to do that and uh, you have other plaque in your aorta area, you have risk for stroke high anyway because your plumbing to connect to the brain has a plaque there, they can dislodge no matter whether you close 
the room or not. So the result, after three, almost the three years follow-up, the result is yes, the watchman that we call the left atrium appendage closure device is not worse than the anticoagulation. Uh, the control group is they use coumadin, right? Right, they use coumadin. So this means it's equal than the coumadin to prevent the stroke. But the problem was all the stroke you will see after they finish study, the, they decreased 28% decrease compared warfarin and left appendage closure for all stroke. So it's significant. That means you probably need to treat 100 patients with closure device and you decreased one people of the stroke. So if you calculate with this, is you have, we have to put 100 patients and then we compare comedy, we decrease one risk for stroke each year. The hemorrhagic stroke is the most benefit. So when you see the patient on comedy, they are one patient each year the event is about 1.6 and with the closure device is only 0.1 percent so it's compared this is the most advantage for <coughs> prevent hemorrhagic stroke compared to the whole stroke it's not sure too much but the hemorrhagic stroke significantly decreased and the mortality is decreased about 38 percent <clears throat> this is why when we try to bring watchmen in East Jefferson Hospital, the company is very hesitant because they try to slowly, step by step, to develop some people familiar with the procedure. You don't want a doctor to do the, this type of device. They only can do three or five cases a year. You want them to do more than like 25, 50 each year for this kind of things. The patient selected is very restricted, so this is why. How many centers that McKinney you know they have? Uh, they're rolling out uh, one every month, I think. But optional is the center in the in the New Orleans area. There is the only one center in. Um, I think in Louisiana. Nobody in the Baton Rouge. No, I don't think I'll, I'll check on that. But I'm not, I don't think so. And actually, it's not the EP doctor do it. It's a congenital heart doctor, right? Dr. Remy is a congenital yes. heart doctor to do this. So the closure device prove a concept. It means left atrial appendage closure device prevents stroke. It is as effective as anticoagulation such as coumadin. So for the short terms, there are expected more early safety events after appendage closure due to pericardial effusions and due to perforation. So the short-term side effect with closure device is high. But when you go longer, longer, and patients have no complication after device deployed, then the risk of the stroke secondary to the bleeding will be decreased. The GI bleeding will be decreased, so the benefit will be sure from the decreased risk for bleeding. So this is, we talk about M plaza. The second is that some people use it as out of labels device to closure the appendage. This device usually for the closure, the PFO is the wall holes between the upper chambers from connect left up to the right atrium. Sometimes some people has a congenital disease. But when you put this device to the appendage, yes, you can close the appendage. So this is the real cases I downloaded from the internet to show some people use this to close the appendage. And after that, they do the TEE, it's, it's pretty good. It's sealed, and when they do the 
3D TEE, you see that the whole appendage ostium is totally occluded. <coughs> Lariat, we tried to bring the lariat in the hospital, but uh, for other reasons, we never can do any case. This is more complex things. This is the device you have to do, put the wires inside your heart, and you also have to puncture the heart outside the surface, so they can uh, kiss each other and deploy the device. This is like a loop, uh, and when you put the loop, uh, appendage inside the loop and you tie it and you close your ostium. So sometimes it's very tight, you can tie re tear the appendage <coughs> tissues and the patient have to be open chest surgery. Sometimes the tight is not strong enough and you have leaking slowly, slowly after you finish the procedure and the appendage getting open, the ostium is open again. This is never approved by the FDA to use it. And the idea is you put a catheter through the vessel in the heart first, and you cross the wall, do the puncture across the wall, put one of the device inside the appendage. And then you do another epicardial puncture outside the heart. This is more dangerous because normal people the space is very tight. If you're not careful, the needle can puncture the, the heart and cause the problem. So if you carefully to do the puncture and successfully, you put another device outside of it and you try to loop appendage. When you loop appendage, you pull the wires and tight the tissues and then you cut the tissues so the procedure will be finished. Uh, a lot of center try with this. Some people get good results, but it's not popular. So this is the real cases from A, B, C, D, it's a sequentially. So first, you put the, do the shape of the appendage, and you put the device inside it, and you do the puncture outside it. This is a magnetic, so they can put, use the magnetic to connect to each other, so you can align the, loop, the, the device. When you align the device, you put the, the loop at the base of the appendage, and you tie it, and you deploy it and finish the cases. Plato is, how many years this out for the market? That's when Four or five years probably? Five, five, five years. That's right, yes, yeah. They use in the old time, it's like a balloon, they deploy inside and suck the ostium of the appendage. But because the complication is so high and the company has no money to improve the device designs so they totally withdraw from the market and nobody use it. This is just a very beginning idea to closure the device. So this, I still show up this. Now we talk about the surgical. So the surgical, no surgical device is approved by the FDA to use for appendage closure only for atrial fibrillation. But when the people do the surgery, for example, you do the valve replacement, and you have history of atrial fibrillation. <coughs> Some doctors take appendage out, staple it, take the tissue out. Some doctors can use this closure device called atriclip to close the ostium of the appendage. The material they use is titanium inside and outside they use it as a polyfibrous and when they close tightly and deploy it and the tissue will be in this area. So they can open, put the appendix, put, put the appendage inside of this. I have a movie when Dr. Brother did this, but unfortunately I, I cannot find where I'm stored. Save it, it's in the cloud somewhere, I cannot find it. Uh, otherwise it's a very impressive. So you will see that really you can see he's used the, the scope and put appendage inside 
the device and then he deploy it and then the closure. And when you do the TE, you will see there is no blood flow across the appendage. So they have different size to choose depending on patient's uh, appendage size. This is my cases. This patient has atrial fibrillation. He take comedy, therapeutic in two to three, but he has a huge brain bleeding, almost disabled and died. So stay in the hospital for three months. So when I finally recovered, I saw him, I said, okay, neurology never let you to take the comedy anymore. Then you have a high risk for stroke again. How about this? Let's close the appendage, and after appendage closure, we do ablation for you. So Dr. Brother first put the atricule in the appendage. And after four weeks later, we bring them in, we do the convergent maze procedure. Now I follow him since the maze procedure almost 16 months. And we have a chip in his chest, the morning we call the review monitoring. Some people must be have that. He has no atrial fibrillation at all. So now he is off the comedines and he is go back to work. So this is probably my last slide. So the conclusion for today is left atrial appendage closure is an ideal device to prevent the stroke from appendage area for atrial fibrillation patient without valve problem. Watchman is the only FDA approved device for this indication in the United States. Other device we talk about today, or even surgical clips, is investigation. It's not FDA approved for that use. So this is the brief <coughs> topic I have today. Any other questions? Don't you? What about that slideshow? Yeah, I want to see whether I can give you guys a movie for about the closure device, what they do. I don't know whether they have um, sound or no sounds. Do they have sounds? No. No sounds. I can choose another one. What about from the bottom? Can you get can you get it from the bottom? Where are I can do it. Look. I can show the other things. Yeah. Let me stop this. Oh I can explain it. Even I never do it. So usually the patient lies on the on the cath lab, all right? We dress up, we put the catheter in first. So we choose the femoral veins and put the sheets in from the vessels to the heart. We reach the right side heart first. Okay, and the appendage we try to close is in the left. So, and you have to deploy the device in the left appendage instead of the right side. Then the first, you put a transeptal catheter, try to cross the hole to the left, and put the wire in. And you can put a sheath to the heart. Okay? And depend on the shape of the appendage. Some patient appendage is wide open, some patient chicken wings. <laughs> so different shape. Actually it's more than this. When you see the anatomy of the appendage is totally different. So you put guide wire in the appendage. They have different size you choose, so the sheath is different. Okay. 
and then you measure with the TEE or intracardiac ultrasound to see how big they are, and then you choose the sheets. You do the angiogram to give the whole shape of the appendage. And then you put the watchman device in there, you pull the sheets out, and the device expands. Then you pull back a little bit, the hook will be attached to the tissue. And you do the angiogram, make sure it's sealed and there's no blood to come from. TE also can confirm whether they have a blood or not, and then you cut it and it will deploy it and the procedure will be finished. It looks easy, but sometimes it's very difficult. In different shape, you use one device that doesn't work, and you, I don't know how much they cost. I still don't know. Oh, we're, we're going to find out. <laughs> and then you may be the second or third. A lot of hospitals told me they're not profit when they started to do this case, because when they first, the doctor experience is not that that much and sometimes the choose the size is different and then they have to use more different size device and then they just waste the money because insurance only pay for one and you use three and the hospital lost the money so not very common the hospital willing to start this new technology but we're still interested with this we're still looking for the new investment to come out from the market because it's real, but some people really did benefit from whatever we do in the future. Thank you. At what point do you consider something like this? If, if, with AFib, at what point? This device, if I choose the patient to suggest them for this, usually the patient has complications. First, they have to take blood in forever. That means they have risk moderate or even high risk for stroke if they don't take blood in. But the problem with <coughs> this patient, if, as long as you take blood in without complications, I prefer medications. But some people, when they take comedy, they're bleeding. Now we change the rato, Pardax, or whatever. Whenever they on the blood in, they continue GI bleeding. I have a patient trans admitted in the hospital three times for GI bleeding. In the end, he refused to take anticoagulation anymore. He just, I'm tired of bleeding and get transfused. So this is why I say, okay, then I think you need a closure device. The only things I can available doing EJ, I send him to the Dr. Brother to get clear. So now he get a clear. And it's almost, one and a half years, he, he's still doing good. And uh, at least so far we follow up, he don't have risk for stroke. He is happy because he don't have skin oozing, bleeding, color changes because of the anticoagulation, no need to come to the hospital for transfusion. So usually the patient with high risk for stroke during the atrial fibrillation and have the complications with the anticoagulation medications. This is probably the most benefit patient. I usually suggest them to consider closure device. I have two questions. One is, uh, what causes the appendage? And the other is, are there other causes of AFib besides our uh, LAA and uh, non-valvular? AFib, are there other types what of What caused appendage? Yes, the appendage, is that a, a weak spot in the heart? Or? It's, a part, it's a residue part of the, the heart. Why we still have this residue part of a tissue and in the future make trouble, I personally don't think it has any functional with this part of the heart. Majority of atrium contribute 20% of your heart pump. So each time your heart beat and squeeze pump, atrial fibrillation uh, will lost 20% of your volume. 
For example, you pump 100 out each time if you normal rhythm. When you have atrial fibrillation come out, and you <coughs> lost, you only pump 80 out, you lost the 20 because of this turbulent in the upper chamber. What the function for appendage probably, I personally don't think they have any. Some people theorize it's, uh, it helps regulate pressure fluctuations because it's got some compliance to it, but nobody really knows. Because surgical, when they do the surgical, the valve change, they always take them out and the heart function with the patient never changed. So from a hemodynamic standpoint, from the history, I never saw their why we, we still need that? It's just a, during the development for human beings, they just stay there. For what kind of function, we really don't know. For me, it's more troublemaker than they have some function. Why, why do we have an appendix? Right. All it does yeah, is get inflamed and infected. <coughs> Your second question is? Um, are there other kinds of AFib besides uh, LAA and uh, non-valvular? Yeah. Atrial fibrillation, actually, you have a lot of reason cause atrial fibrillation. Age, female is also risk, uh, coronary disease, hypertension, sleep apnea. You, you can give tons of the reason for that. And not everybody with AFib will cause a stroke. You will see that it's only about 30 to 35% stroke related to the atrial fibrillation. That means 60% to 65% of people, their stroke is not from the heart. Some people with normal heart rhythm, they still have a stroke. That means whatever reason cause the AFib, they also damage your vessels. They damage your vessel in the brain, they damage your carotid vessels, the aorta area, anything cause the plaque in your vessels. Or Mid dysfunction of your vessels, then they can build a cloud and <coughs> dislodge and cause the stroke. So, AFib is only part of the reason. It's not always the reason. So, the Watchman device, about how long is that surgery? How long does that take? If it's done? I personally don't have experience. For my thing, because EP duct always do the transeptor very quickly. Five, ten minutes, we finish all the transeptor angiogram. I think probably one to two hours is reasonable, average. The most difficult is you try to choose the perfect size to match your ostium of the appendage. You see the appendage, sometimes the basal is very open. You don't have fixed things to match that area. Then you have to put device deeper, deeper to close the device. But now you lose, you leave a lot of space. The blood still can turbulence in that open space and then build a cloud. So I personally think when I talk to the people who do this, some centers stop doing this because it's just individually very difficult to choose the perfect size. And the <coughs> size, they only have five sizes to choose from some patient they think they are fit for the procedure, but when they do the, bring the patient in and do the angiogram, and then they start, suddenly find they have trouble. And a lot of patients put in, they still has a leaking for like a five millimeter leaking. So you always has a, a flow inside appendage to the other part of atrium. And then when they follow up this kind of patient, the patient's risk of stroke increased. So some doctors, in some center, they do the early stage with their watchmates. They're prone to, to abandon this procedure. Uh, the people who not do this kind of procedure, like me, sometimes willing to, to do the procedure. So when I go to the HRS this year, it's very interesting debate. The people who do more, they saw the more complications, they're prone to delay and put the device in. And a lot of people do less or never do it and willing to try and see whether it's, it's work. So I personally don't know. What do you think, Dr. King? It's tough because sometimes you can't put a square peg in a round hole and 
Right now, we don't have the capability to individually print. Maybe one day with 3D printing, we'll be able to print out a unique Watson type device. But I think you've touched on all the problems. You can't always match it to the patient. But we always still have the we still always have the Atriclip device, which I think is a good alternative. <coughs> the two haven't been matched in a randomized trial to know which is best. Obviously, the disadvantage of the Atriclip is you got to have to have to have a small incision in the chest to deploy it. But so there's a lot of unknowns, but most of our patients, we don't have the liberty of waiting a long period of time. They've had a major bleed and they're at risk of stroke and we have to make a decision. Now we will be doing the Watchman in the next few months. It's technically not that difficult a procedure because the skill is really in getting across the septum, the transeptal skill. Once you're in there, the deployment's not that difficult, I would not think. But um, th there's still some unknowns, but what do you do with the patient, for example, who's had a major bleed into the brain and has a big risk for stroke and you can't use blood thinners anymore? Mm -hmm. Those are the patients we've been getting lately that were sort of between a rock and a hard place. So we can't tell you what's the best one, but we but there are at least some options now that we didn't have at least a year ago. Any other questions? It, it may be in the future, Jen, that you know some patients just will say we don't want to take the blood thinners, and they'll, they'll have these kind of devices because they're at least as good as the blood thinners, and you don't have the bleeding risk. So you, this is one case where if it works well, you can have your cake and eat it too. So if it's still in trial, do they no, last a long not, time? It's Sorry, not in trial anymore. It's oh. completed. It's, it's an ongoing FDA surveillance program. So data is still being sent back to the FDA, and obviously if they see a big rise in complications, they can halt it. But it is available, it is FDA approved. Uh, one center here in New Orleans is using it, although kind of sparingly. We will be the second center to roll out with it within the next two months. Uh, the Lariat that Dr. Zhao showed you, um, there have been too many deaths with it. We, we've not uh, pursued that. So. Basically, we would have, by the end of the year, the option of using the Atriclip, which some of our patients have already had, versus the Watchman. FDA approved for three years. So they, they approved on September, I think, September 2015. So they have three years monitoring. If after three years, they probably have every one year evaluation until they permanent approved for that. With AFib, does that, I, I, I'm assuming that the life form thing, once you have it, or once you have AFib, but does it necessarily mean that you'll have to do any of these things or that you'll just continue to have AFib to you over? I personally don't think so. I think AFib is a very, very prolonged progress disease. Some people, 40% of people don't feel it. So when some people find, oh, I have AFib coming because I feel shit on the grass or palpitation, and then my doctor do a KG find I AFib. Usually, it's not the first cases unless very young people they very clarified we don't have AFib and then I feel it. Most, a lot of patients I see in the clinic, they constant every day in the AFib. That is not the first one. Usually, the first episode of AFib is very short period, a couple of minutes or seconds they disappear. And then some people maybe have a big event for a couple hours, push them to the ER, they have to get the medicine stop. If that is true first cases, usually they have a very quiet period for a couple of years. Different individuals, different. Some people, when you talk the story with them, they have between 10 years, some people between two years, some people just a couple of months. So after that, you will see they become, become more frequently because they're getting older, they maybe have high, start to have hypertension, diabetes, obesity, sleep apnea, slowly, slowly de develop. And then you will see the AFib is more frequently and more longer than before. And then if it's not controlled at that period, the disease progress will continually because when you have AFib, you will continue damaging heart cells. And then when they damage heart cells, it becomes scar tissues, irritated and they will maintain the atrial fibrillation. So that's like a bad circle continually. Then you will become more person every day. And in the end, we call it chronic. That means no matter what we do, shop, procedure, medication, you never stop it. 
So that is looks like for me it looks like a heart failure. Stage progress disease because we live longer. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.